Hi, I'm Alex Buffman with Below the Radar, and you're listening to The Power of Disability with your host, community organizer, social entrepreneur, and author, Alad Mansky. This is a six-part series of the Below the Radar podcast. The Power of Disability features interviews with special guests centering and celebrating the contributions of people with disabilities. Disease, disorder, what can it be? There's no need for sympathy. Disease, disorder, epilepsy. There is nothing wrong with me. Hello. My name is Al Edmansky, and this is the Power of Disability podcast, highlighting what history has overlooked, the contributions of people with disabilities. Today's Power of Disability guest is Judy Human. Judy is a lifelong at- activist and leader in the disability rights movement in the United States, but also internationally. At 18 months of age, Judy was paralyzed with polio and has used a wheelchair ever since. For decades, she's been at the forefront of the disability rights movement, uh, protest movement. Um, I don't know if this was your first one or not, Judy, but in order for you to be licensed as a teacher uh, in New York, you had to sue the New York City Board of Education. my first lawsuit. Okay. Your first first lawsuit. (laughs) First of many. You're an early founder of the independent living movement. Uh, You participated, led, organized the longest sit-in of a federal government building uh, lasting 28 days back in 1977. Um, I think there were many occupations. The two main ones were San Francisco and Washington. Um, You were the first ever advisor, special advisor on disability rights for the United States State Department under President Obama. You have been an advisor to the World Bank on disability and development. Um, Your work is featured most recently in the Netflix documentary film, Crip Camp, uh, A Disability Revolution, which was the winner of the Sundance Audience Award. And I've just found out that it's uh, now on the shortlist for documentaries uh, 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 with regard to the Oscars. And uh, you uh, were identified by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential women in history. And uh, Judy is the author of uh, a new book, A Being Human an unrepentant memoir of a disability rights advocate. And there it is on our screen. I've got my Kobo copy here of it as well, uh, Judy. Um, You're speaking to us from your home in Washington, DC. So welcome. Uh, And I'm I'm really, I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, And one of the reasons is that um, you're a mentor not only to people around the world, but also to many Canadians. And over the last two weeks, as I've told people that I was going to be speaking to you, they all had a singular story to tell me about you. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. And, oh, I didn't go to that event. And then I heard she was coming or I met her uh, in the uh, in a separate room just as she was boarding an airport, et cetera. So, so everybody's got a story about you. And I've just kind of outlined the general story that's out there about you, but how would how would you describe yourself? Nobody's ever answered that. So today I am a 73-year-old white disabled woman in the foyer of our apartment. I use a motorized wheelchair at polio, as you mentioned. When I was 18 months old, I have on a purple uh, sweater and purple and teal earrings, glasses, and um, I'm wearing a Jewish star. And we're in the foyer of uh, our apartment where I have a lot of, you know, photos of family and plants and and how do I describe myself outside of what I look like? Um, I'm an activist. I like being an activist. I'm a problem solver. I'm a networker. I like to learn from other people what's going on. And um, 
I feel that in the darkest of times, we have to be positive. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, working together um, really makes a difference. And I guess part of the question is, how big should the circle be? And certainly one thing that I've learned over the course of my life, and I assume you too, is, you know, you, we grew up in our neighborhoods, and our neighborhoods were not necessarily reflective of the diversity of our countries. And um, so, you know, we didn't learn things that we could have been learning if racism and homophobia and uh, anti-Semitism and uh, anti-Muslims on and on, Asian, etc., didn't exist. And so I think what's been important for me over the course of my life really has been, and, and both the book and the film, Crip Camp, you know, you see a growing diversity of disabled people and that to me was always I mean it was just happening and it was um, it's been really valuable to meet and learn people learn from people how they do various things and you know what we need to do to be respectful and collaborative with other people so I like the work that I've been doing because it's not just been a local community, it's been national and then international. So meeting other people with similar problems, uh, sharing information with each other, both about how we feel and how it's important to work collaboratively with people to try to have big dreams, to recognize they may not happen overnight, and to be able to change. And when I say change, you know, as our societies change and advance, you know, things that we never thought would have been possible in the 1950s and 60s, like social media, you know, it's a completely different world. And so I think being able to also be intergenerational is something that's very important for me because I don't know how to do so many things that younger people just have grown up doing and have no idea that we don't understand what they're talking about. So I guess that's a little of who I am. Thank you. Um, I know color is very important to you. To you, Your book is just resplendent with descriptions of moments uh, that you uh, recall in, in terms of color. And I you write about uh, your early childhood days and you said, if I was going to describe them, I would describe them in bright pinks and lavender. And then there's always this, on the other hand, side of things. And you talk about the beautiful dress that your mother put on you uh, when you were going to kindergarten for the first time. And then you met a man, a principal there who, um, who called you a fire height, a fire hazard. Um, and uh, so that juxtaposition between this brightness and the light and the and the colors, and then this right in your right in your face uh, challenge that occurred out of you know out of the blue. To use another color term, can you right. talk a little bit more about that? Moment? I mean, you know, at five years old, I didn't really know what was going on. I did know that my mom took me to school to register me. And I didn't go back to school the next day. And that my mother said I couldn't, principal wouldn't let me go to the school because it wasn't accessible. Yeah. And I don't remember when I first learned that it was a fire hazard for me to go there, but that is a term that really um, became something that people would use rather frequently. Obviously that's just for me but for other people and, um, you know, it was a way of deflecting responsibility and making the person being discriminated against, in this case, disabled people become the victims and the perpetrators, Yeah. Yeah. right? It's like, 
we were being victimized and couldn't go to school. But, you know, the adverse effect that that was going to happen on us, to us, people really didn't think of, didn't care about, denied. Mm -hmm. And you say when you were five, you, you didn't really completely understand what was going on or didn't, you know, this uh, was a dawning awareness. And I, I don't want to dwell too much on that, that period in your life, but it is another description you used for yourself. As you said, you, you, uh, as a result of an experience on the way to the candy store that you had this sudden realization and understanding about yourself that you were a butterfly becoming a caterpillar. Right. Well, the incident basically was I was going to the store with a friend. I didn't have a motorized wheelchair at that time. I don't even know if they were around, but they, but we certainly did know about them. And uh, she was pushing my wheelchair and a kid came over and asked me if I was sick. And as the book reflects, it's this interaction with this boy. I was that eight asking me if I'm sick. And um, it was this rude awakening that that's how people saw me, that if you used a wheelchair, you were sick. And then, of course, you know, as an adult, that makes sense because, you know, you, you saw people, A, infrequently in wheelchairs, and B, when you did see them on television, which was in and of itself also something new in that generation, uh, you frequently saw people who were in wheelchairs and it was a negative experience and they would be healed and start walking or they were evil or whatever it was, but more often than not, nothing because you didn't see people in wheelchairs. But I, I think, you know, over the years, I've learned that eight, nine years old is a time when people notice their difference, whether you have a disability or you're a different race or you dress differently because of your clothing, whatever it may be, it's a time when you begin to notice yourself and others notice you. Um, and maybe a time when people are becoming, you know, more bullying, more abusive. And I think that is something that we have seen, you know, in today's society, uh, continue to be a major problem and in some ways worse than it was then. 2020 was a was a big year for you for you. Um, uh, the, the time nomination as 100 one of the 100 most influential women as I mentioned uh, the crypt in the panel. 20th century in the 20th century well yeah I got 1977 <laughs> was the year for me okay um, Right. Well, 100 years is still a pretty big span. So congratulations yeah. for that. But so there was that nomination, the Crip Camp documentary um, arrived on Netflix, and it's still there. At least it is in Canada and uh, and your book. But you told me that there was another experience that was equally uh, exhilarating for you. And that was to be interviewed by Trevor Noah. And uh, this gets to another description of you. <laughs> he, I think, called you a fierce badass. Right. <laughs> So first of all, how did you, I mean, how did you manage to get on, uh, on his show? I have no idea. They called and asked. I, I assume it was maybe Netflix and Beacon when the book was coming out, the film was coming out that were, you know, a advertising things and they called and I was like, yeah, of course. I love Trevor Noah. He's like one of my most favorite people. And so being asked to be in that program was very humbling. Well, really? um, it may have been humbling for him as well, because uh, he claimed in the middle of the segment, and people have to watch it. It's just incredible. But he claimed you can watch it by going, go to YouTube, put in Trevor Noah March 4th. Okay. And there's two parts. One is the 10 minute interview between he and myself. And then they take a short part of it and put it in the 30 minute production. Okay. Well, I think I've seen both, and he claims you threatened him <laughs> during the uh, during the the segment, uh, and it got the biggest laugh. 
of, of the night for sure. And you, you, in quotation marks, threatened him by making the distinction between his use of the word able-bodied and your uh, use of the term non-disabled. And I, I wonder if you could, you could explain that difference for our, for our audience here. I don't like any of these words, like yeah. able, because to me, it, um, it said it's like a power term. You know, he's able, I'm not able. I'm able, he's able. But I prefer to use the term disabled and non-disabled. So that one of the reasons why I was really, that show was uh, important to me when it was finished was because when he used the term able-bodied and I very quickly was thinking, am I gonna say something about this? I don't like this word. And so I did, I said, I don't use the word able-bodied, I use the word non-disabled. And he said, are you threatening me? And, um, you know, you can tell there, I kind of stepped back and I don't remember what I said, I guess I am, but, um, but of course I wasn't. But the, the point of this was many people acquire their disabilities as they get older and people can have temporary or permanent disabilities. And the issue is not to be afraid of it. And so, <laughs> I thought it was very um, interesting that he used the term, are you threatening me? And honestly, I would love to talk with him again about that because I think it's the right word. I think people view disability as a threat. And, you know, it was so spontaneous on both of our ends that, um, but, but I think it's the crux of one of the major issues that we deal with which is that non-disabled people are afraid of acquiring a disability, which is something that will be inevitable for a short or longer period of time, either in their own personal life or with their family. And the ability to really think about it in a proactive way, what we need as a community to do in order to ensure that the barriers we face now as many of them as possible are removed. And the barriers are both physical barriers, but also barriers where people are disrespectful, people abuse people who are weaker than they are, um, people don't get the financial supports that they need to get the technology they need, the wheelchairs, the hearing aids, the glasses, you know, the healthcare supports, whatever it may be personal assistance services. And frequently it's left up to those of us, I'm sorry, it's left up to those of us who have disabilities with friends who are doing the advocating where if society itself really was willing to listen and learn and discuss, we could be creating you know, a world which was opening and welcoming to people we have various types of differences. I'm in the foyer of our apartment and my husband's going out, so hold on. Life under COVID. Yeah, life under COVID. And um, I, I, I want to go down so many uh, different pathways here, but I think, I think you fell in love with your husband's shoulders first. Is that... <laughs> It's true. <laughs> yeah, I was in I was in Eugene, Oregon, and uh, I saw his shoulders, his back. He was sitting in his wheelchair, and very powerful shoulders. It's um, you know, I want to I want to ask you a little bit more about what you've just said uh, in the context of the first line in your book, uh, which was, "I never wished." I didn't have a disability. Um, uh, so what did you wish for? I wish that I could live my life and do what I wanted to do with my disability. Because, you know, I've never walked. I, I don't dream about walking. I, you know, I do uh, <laughs> work towards and fight for and you know, accessibility and 
personal assistance services and things like that. But I never think about, I wish I didn't have a disability. Mm -hmm. um, I've witnessed with my own daughter and I've seen it so many times uh, imposed on others um, that people have tried to shape my daughter's dreams. Uh, right. including, including me as her parent, as her dad, um, and even further telling her what to think, <laughs> what to feel, uh, what she should be doing. Uh, so I, I don't know if you experience that. I mean, those are the expectations that come at you from others, including well-meaning people. Um, um, how did you combat uh, people who were treading on your dream? I I don't really feel so much that, uh, let's see. You asked very interesting question. I, I feel like society itself was treading, not just on my dreams, but on our dreams. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, really being around other disabled people, which I, started to happen when I was like nine, when I finally started going to school, segregated classes, and then camps. My neighborhood, obviously, I was the only disabled person in the neighborhood. And uh, in the family, when I went to synagogue, and um, I was the only one with a physical disability. And, but it was the society itself that by lack of examples was not really encouraging dreaming. You know, so obviously that was, you know, clamping down, but it wasn't so much when I was younger that people said, I couldn't be this or that. It's, it was indirectly being said because I didn't see people like myself as teachers, as doctors, as social workers, um, as scientists. Um, you know, Franklin Roosevelt was president. And he was a wheelchair user, and that I definitely knew about. You know, my parents told me about that. Um, but really, it was the need for myself with other people to start thinking about what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and then when I decided I wanted to be a teacher, my, some of my friends in high school who had disabilities were like, no, don't tell the agency that's going to pay for you to go to school that you want to be a teacher because they likely will not pay for you to study the, for a job that, you can't show them someone else was hired using a wheelchair to be a teacher. And that was true. I didn't know anybody who had been hired uh, who was a wheelchair user. So at least for me, um, I guess, you know, I studied piano instead of taking occupational therapy. And it was a very smart thing on my parents' part. And um, I studied voice, and I, I was, at that point in my life, really a good singer. And I auditioned at Juilliard, and uh, they told me I should come back a year later because I was a little young. And my parents really did not, they really um, loved my voice. They kind of supported it, but they really felt that I'd not be able to make a career in the theater. And so I guess that was one area that, you know, Ali Stroker, who is a disabled woman in the United States, the first wheelchair user to be on Broadway and to win a Tony Award. Uh, she's in her thirties now. And she's really, you know, broken one of the big barriers. Um, but in the 19, 60s and 70s it was not going to be me unfortunately i think it would have been fun 
the, the I, this issue of culture, you know, has many dimensions to it. There's just the artistic culture, the expression um, of uh, who we are and what we want to convey uh, through all of the mediums of art. But there's also culture in the broader sense of, um, you know, of, of who we are uh, as, as a group, who we are as a people. And you you write about this in your book and, and in your own YouTube channel, I think you go out of your way to reveal, display the, the splendor of what could only be called uh, a disability culture. Um, yes. And, um, and you talk about uh, this in terms of claiming one's disability, uh, taking back the language, developing a shared description of what's going on, uh, whether it's analysis or beyond, helping people to find each other, pride, power comes out of that. Can you talk a little bit more about this? Because this, I, 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 uh, I've come <laughs> with my age to really appreciate the, this cultural dimension of change as a, a really important ingredient. It's, it's invisible or silent, so not easily grabbed onto, but what is your thought? I mean, for me, I think people like to belong. And for those of us who have disabilities, where the disability plays a significant part of our life or in our life, and we're the ones that will determine that. Uh, for me, it's always been important to be able to meet other people who understand what I'm talking about. And by that, I mean, I can talk with them about discrimination and they get it. I can talk about how I feel about it and they get it. And we can also talk about no longer allowing ourselves to be victims and what we need to do in order to you know, reclaim who we are and create who we are. And I think that's really been um, very important. and. You know, it's a part of who I am. So I'm a woman, I'm Jewish. All those things are important to me. Pulling all those things together are important to me. But it also means then that these different parts of who I am, I, I want them to be able to like come together. And that means that, you know, my, my being, a disabled Jewish woman, I need in the Jewish community and the women's community to also have the same level of uh, respect and camaraderie that I do in the disability community. And that doesn't really yet exist in many of the other communities that we belong to. Because many of the other communities really still discriminate against disabled people. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's knowingly discriminate or not. But, you know, I remember, you know, in the 70s when the women's movement was really emerging more and disabled women uh, were feeling that we were not really included in what was going on and we were trying to become a part of what was happening. And I remember I was living, I grew up in Brooklyn, but I was living in Berkeley at the time. And there was a meeting going on and the women had said it needed to be held in an accessible building. And then I remember us talking and saying, if nobody shows up in a wheelchair, what is that gonna mean? And, you know, that may sound, well, you know, it, there was an expectation that if something was going to be accessible and we didn't participate, that it, things shouldn't be accessible in the future, as opposed to these are the way things should always be. And, you know, if people aren't coming, there should be a discussion about why. Mm -hmm. You know, why are people not coming? Are they not feeling a part of what's going on? Do they not feel like they belong? So, you know, any needing to really have a better understanding of the impact of exclusion and what needs to be done 
in order to enable people to feel comfortable about coming in and participating, you know? Um, <clears throat> you, uh, it seems to me that a big part of your career as an activist has been reaching out uh, to, to other groups, to other movements from the very beginning. One of the most memorable scenes in Black in uh, Crip Camp is um, is when the Black Panthers showed up with support, and I know their support involved many dimensions, uh, including food, but also helping people to get from Berkeley to to Washington and whatever. Um, and did and as I understand it, you were the one who had reached out and had formed those alliances uh, at, at the beginning, or yeah, but so. The people who worked on the 504 demonstration, it was a, a big group of us. And Kitty Cohn and myself were two of the people and others. Uh, the reason why the Black Panthers got involved is one of the founders of the Panthers uh, in Oakland, California in the 1960s had a disability. And he was part of the work that was going on uh, both at CIL in Oakland and with the demonstration. So it was Brad Lomax that got the Panthers involved because he was a member of the Panthers. So, and then we also obviously reached out to labor unions, women's groups, the farm workers, um, many, many other uh, groups, my LGBTQ community, you know, the veterans community, many others. And I think that was, something uh, that we always did because when we started organizing uh, at the Berkeley CIL and other centers for independent living, uh, we always found it to be valuable to reach out to others because we wanted them to invite us to participate with them when they were doing things and vice versa. And we did that because you know, there are disabled veterans, um, disabled people who are poor, many, uh, disabled people who, you know, become disabled, who are farm workers, all types of things, women's movement. And it really was, we felt very important to be building bridges mm -hmm. and cooperation and collaboration. You wrote in your, in your book, Judy, that, um, in a world of increasing inclusivity, it seems particularly odd that popular media still excludes one very large segment, section of the population. And you, you made an, an analogy between the characters, the powerful characters in Black Panther movie uh, versus the characters originally portrayed in those Black exploitation films of the early 1970s. And, and, uh, and comparing uh, or suggesting that we needed a similar uh, renaissance or um, refreshing uh, view of uh, people with disabilities in popular culture. Um, Crip Camp um, is a, a potential uh, strike in that direction, would you say? Um, do, you, do you see more of that happening now? I, I know you've interviewed many, many uh, disabled people who are now part of popular culture, but what's your sense of where, where it's going? Is there sufficient momentum now? Do you think that uh, we can look for something similar to a Black Panther epiphany no. within Hollywood? Someday, but who knows? I don't want to say when. I want to say that um, we are definitely moving in the right direction. There are more and more disabled people who are professionals in many of these industries who have not yet been given the recognition they need. And I think one of the important things that's happening is that more disabled people are coming together. Um, in journalism and documentary filmmaking, in many, many areas, both to, again, this model of sharing stories about success and barriers, what needs to be done in order to get the stories of disabled people being told in authentic ways, getting disabled people in journalism rooms, not just 
writing about disability, but being able to write about disability is a part of what they're doing and also have the ability to tell stories. Like if you think about community organizing and uh, telling the stories of people in communities who are organizing in various, various groups, I think really having somebody that understands disability is very important because they can ask questions about what is happening in the area of disability that many other people would not think to ask. You know, I was in Kenya and uh, I was meeting with uh, disabled women's groups and one of the issues in the US is the higher rate of violence against disabled girls and women, sexual assault and violence. And it's only been, I think in the last 10 to 15 years, that there is some data that's actually being collected in this regard. And that data shows that disabled girls and women experience higher rates of violence. And so when I was in Kenya, um, and we were talking to reporters, I raised this issue. And um, because the women I had been speaking to and the women I spoke to in many countries, either because I asked them or they brought it up on their own, were talking about violence against disabled women, not being able to get prosecutions, um, you know, being victims who are not being seen and heard. And that's a very important discussion. And women who are working in the area of uh, abuse against disabled girls and women need to understand that A, disabled girls and women are victims at a higher rate, and B, they women who are abused, in many cases, who did not have a disability previously may well now mm have some form of mental health disability and may also have a physical disability because the violence is perpetrated in so many ways. So I think getting back to what we were talking about earlier around Trevor Noah, you know, disability happens in so many ways. And um, a woman, for example, who's victimized and then is not even really brought back into her own community because she is a victim um, and many ways we could discuss it, but at the end of the day, a lens of disability needs to be put on everything that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Disabled people need to be able to feel proud of who we are. Being pride doesn't mean we're not experiencing pain. We need to really be able to both address the joy and sorrow that we feel by the experiences that we have. We need to feel not alone. We need to see the commonality, not just in the disability community and others, but other communities. And we need to feel uh, as comrades that we want to work together. We want to be changing our communities. Uh, not just for disabled people, but for all a disadvantaged population, discriminated against populations. Mm -hmm. This this broader sense of solidarity, uh, Judy, reminds me of an experience I had a couple of years ago where I was in a room uh, that was full of Indigenous activists who were um, uh, developing a campaign to protest the expansion of uh, tanker traffic off our West Coast here uh, in British Columbia. And um, one of the most seasoned and, and frankly successful and well-known indigenous activists at one point during the uh, discussion uh, said, why do they keep treating me the way they do? Do they not think I'm human? And um, I mean, you've got a wonderful name for a variety of reasons and your book called Being, you know, um, Human, human uh, you know, fits, but also you have a chapter in your book uh, called Human. And, and this, this sense of, of being unworthy or objectified, um, 
depersonalized, however you want to describe it, but not being recognized as, as human, uh, it seems to me is consistent among many liberation movements. I, I mean, the, the slogan, the emblem, the motto of the first abo abolitionist movement back in the late 1700s in England was, am I not, in those days they all use male language, but am I not a man? I mean, am I not human? Uh, so do you have any, I guess the, we're coming to the end of our talk, but do you have any reflections on this? Because this, this is not, this is deep and, <laughs> you know, gets to the core of who we are uh, as, as people. And maybe some people might call this philosophical or spiritual, but I'm just wondering if you have any reflections on this notion. I, I do think that people, when they don't believe you're equal to them, they don't think you're a human. You're a human being. You're not valued the same way. And if you don't value someone, you don't consider I don't consider your life to be as important as my life, um, then I'm not going to really be looking out for you or listening to you and learning from you about what I may be doing to inflict that on you, what I need to be doing with others to change that. Listening and learning, I think, is really something that, you know, people don't do. Or maybe it's painful to listen and learn and people still don't act but you know part of the chapter in the book takes place in a rural area in the state of Andhra Pradesh in India mm -hmm. and I was meeting uh, I was with the World Bank at that point and we went to a, this rural area because there was a, a couple of, there were a couple of programs that were being run uh, by disabled people rights-based programs and one of the questions that I asked people in the group was, you know, what is one of the things that's changed? And a couple of people said they were being called by their names. So previously, they were not being called by their birth names. They were being called in a derogatory term uh, using a word around disability in a negative way. Mm -hmm. And so they're forming a group of people who came together as disabled people, supported each other, began to talk about to the leaders in the in the communities what the issues were, what they needed, what needed to change. Um, was very profound. One of the stories in this chapter is um, there was a little boy in the group um, whose mother, um, when he was born, had no arms. And her mother-in-law had told her that she was not to feed the baby. And this group, the commitments group, went and spoke to the grandmother, explaining that she had to allow the mother to feed the child child. And uh, they had also been working with the police to allow the police to know some of the situations that were going on in the community. And obviously the grandmother, uh, one way or the other, the mother was feeding the child. He was really quite healthy, you know, when we met him. Uh, but I think it's very important for people to understand this stigma and discrimination that people with disabilities face in many countries. And in some countries, you know, when you think about people of albinism in about 26 countries in Africa, um, some of these people are being forced to live in segregated camps. Uh, some of them have had body parts cut off, have been slain uh, because religious leaders are saying, the bones are magic. Um, and there is more work that is being done to address these issues and to prosecute people, but still not where it needs to be. It's still occurring. And so um, these are some of the outcomes of not 
recognizing that people are human. We look and sound different, maybe, but we have a heart, we breathe, we eat, and we want to be accepted and contribute. Thank you. Um, Judy, you dedicate your book to your to your parents, Ilsa and Werner Human, uh, who ignored the doctor's advice to put you in an institution when you were a wee baby. Uh, and you thank them for the belief that you could do uh, anything. Um, the role of parents as allies or, uh, or the, is changing as the, as the disability nature, uh, narrative changes. Um, and the role of allies, I think, is changing. Um, for all of the reasons that you've talked about today. Could you um, reflect on, on the role of allies um, in the process of change that, uh, um, that is uh, occurring in the disability movement now? I mean, I think the role of parents and allies is an important one and sometimes a difficult one because, you know, I feel very strongly that Parents need to play appropriate roles in the lives of their children, whether their children have disabilities or not. Parents also need to allow their children to grow up. And even if they have a significant disability, to be helping to put things in place so that um, the voices of their children, who are now adults, are ones that can come forward, that their voices can come forward. And uh, where that doesn't happen, I think it's still a part of, you know, the problems because people know that parents um, play a certain role in their children's lives. And for non-disabled children, uh, they step back or they're pushed back because their adult kids won't let them do that. And in many cases, you know, because disabled people have to rely on families because there aren't things in place that need to be in place, um, it, it becomes a problem. And I think allies need to understand too that um, being supportive is very important. Obviously we need allies, but we also need to make sure that it's the voices of disabled people that are the prominent voices. Just like, you know, in the women's movement, the indigenous movement, black movement, Latinx movement, whatever it may be, it isn't a movement which is controlled by allies. Allies participate. Um, it's been 21 or 31 years or getting close to 31 years since the passage of the Americans with Disability Act, uh, Judy, and you've now got a new president and vice president with a firm and clear commitment to uh, People with disabilities. Um, are you are you optimistic? Where do you see the the disability movement going in America? I think the disability movement is moving forward. It's growing. It's expanding. It's becoming more and more diverse, both by race and ethnicity and sexual orientation and disability and intergenerational. Um, all of which I think is very, very important. And we're not gonna be going back, we are going forward. I think, you know, you do see, as we were discussing earlier, the importance and the role that disabled people are playing in media, it is improving slowly. And um, disabled people are getting jobs in areas that we didn't get before. And I think in voting, I, we don't have time now, but I really love to hear, because I don't know the answer about how people uh, register to vote in Canada, but it's there's a group in the U.S. called the American Association of People with Disabilities. They have a project called Rev Up, and Rev Up has been very, very involved in. It's nonpartisan, so helping ensure that people get registered to vote and helping them learn what their rights are if they have a disability, about how to vote, and uh, if there's a problem, who to call. And I would say that, you know, the voices of disabled people in voting are definitely being heard, not just within the disability community, but within the political parties and by people running for office. 
recognizing that they do need to answer our letters about what their positions are. They, they do need to recognize that in the US we're 61 million people, not all of voting age, but a significant number of us, and that counting us out is a problem for them. And I fully, I, I'm very happy about the changes in our government. Uh, I don't know how to express that strong enough. And I also feel that the, the previous administration has done great damage and that, you know, the new administration, Biden-Harris, uh, they have a lot of work to do. It's not only bringing in good people, which they are, but it's really being able to both rebuild our government agencies, which were so negatively affected, but it's also really allowing people in the United States to understand the role of good government. And, uh, you know, COVID, I think, is a perfect example of the strengths and weaknesses here in other countries. Our lack of an effective public health care system. So state by state, the distribution of the vaccines, et cetera, are still quite problematic. And I do hope that one of the outcomes, um, using COVID as an example, will be a relook at what needs to happen. Judy Human, thanks for speaking with me today and for illustrating the power of disability and uh, for also illustrating what you ended your book with, that uh, people with disabilities are leaders of inclusiveness and community and love and equity and justice. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you, Al, very much. It was a privilege. We'll put links to Judy's book, your book, Judy, uh, on our website, along with the YouTube channel um, that you have. And I think we'll make sure to put that interview with Trevor Noah on there. <laughs> and I would really recommend that people get your book, uh, Being Human, uh, for your next purchase or for your book club. And, and the book is coming out like very shortly next week, I think, in softcover. And in the summer, on June 5th, June 15th, it's coming out in a youth edition, Excellent. a young adult's version. Excellent. So thank you all. Thank you, Judy. And if you want to read more about the power of disability, you can check out my own website, alatmansky.com. Uh, subscribe to the Disability Digest that we have there, or check out my latest book, The Power of Disability, Lessons for Surviving, Thriving, and changing the world. Thanks for listening, everybody. Until next time. Thank you. Bye. This has been the second part of The Power of Disability, a special six-part series of the Below the Radar podcast. Check back next Thursday for the third installment. This series is curated and hosted by the community organizer, social entrepreneur, and author, Alec Natsky. Theme music for The Power of Disability is There Is Nothing Wrong With Me Epilepsy by Todd Oseki. The production of this series is supported by SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement.